Uh, good morning. My name is Catalin Roth, and I'm a general internist and a geriatrician at Medical Faculty Associates at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. I work in the clinic, in the hospital, and also in nursing homes. And the geriatricians in my department also make house calls. We strive to provide the best, most wonderful health care to our patients, yet there are so many times that we are unable to give excellent or even good care because of limitations in our health delivery system. That is why most doctors in the United States are strongly in favor of health reform. I am very excited to be here. But I'm also very nervous because this is the second time in my career that I have hoped to see real meaningful health reform. As a physician, I know we need reform with a commitment to basic health coverage for all, a commitment to primary care, and quality systems that don't let patients fall through the, crack, through the cracks. Today, even people who have health insurance, which they think is pretty good coverage, find themselves unable to access the care they need when they need it. Many seniors on tight budgets do not come to see their doctor because they cannot afford the copay insurance, or they cannot access transportation which meets their medical needs, or their adult children can't bring them to clinic because they can't take the time off from work. Many of my patients have multiple problems and cannot afford the staggering costs of their medications. Once their prescription plan has spent down to the maximum, this, many seniors will fall through the famous donut hole where they need to cover the costs of the next $2,000 before insurance will contribute again, and they may not have that money to spare. The President's health care reform will address that. We need care coordination between doctors, hospitals, nursing, and rehab facilities so that tests are not duplicated and necessary medications and treatments and goals of care are not lost in transfers. And the, patient, the president's health care reform plan will address that too. We need more primary care doctors and we need more trained geriatricians the Obama plan will address this need. The problems in our health care system are complex, but not untreatable. The worst medicine for our current system would be to continue with the system we have now and to miss the opportunity for change. It is my great pleasure and honor now to introduce to you a distinguished public servant who has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to senior citizens, the Vice President of the United States, Vice President Joe Biden. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Please, sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Doctor, you are uh, were every parent's dream. This is the woman who went to Yale Law School, and then went to Yale Medical School. <laughs> and my mother is so disappointed in me. I, uh, uh, let me begin by saying to you, I'm going to be passing the petition around after I speak, asking you to all sign a note that I can give to my mother. Uh, my mother is 92 and lives with me. And uh, she, uh, although I was necessarily late, I won't bore you with the detail, she will be very upset, but she'll find out I was late to see you, which is something that's a cardinal rule in her home, and she lives in my home, which is her home. Uh, and uh, so would you please write a note for me so she finds out about this, that I was late, because I'm sure the press said, he was due here a half hour ago, and uh, so I, I, <laughs> I need your help. And, uh, Doc, you said you feel intimidated. I feel intimidated. Barbara Mikulski's here. Uh, <laughs> Barbara, even though I'm obviously much older and I was senior to Barbara in the Senate, she has forgotten more about this than I'm going to know. Barbara, it's great to see you, and I'm glad you're feeling better, kid. Uh, and uh, I tell you what, 
uh, everyone looks at her and uh, um, knows that the fact that she's presently for a moment in a wheelchair is in no way to disregard her. She'll run over you in the wheelchair if you get in the way. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Barbara, it's got great. Mountain got mountain bike wheels on it. <laughs> if you ever had a fighter in Maryland, man, this is it. And then you sent us Ben Cardin, which was the best thing you've sent in a long, long, long time. And, uh, I'm going to get in trouble here. I'm going to forget if I don't c talk about Chris in the Congress. We in the, we in the Senate always uh, had great respect for the House. They never showed as much for us, but we always had <laughs> great respect for them in the House. But Chris, it's great to see you, Congressman, and I. And I, uh, who else I have? There's also a lot of state legislators here, I'm told. Guys, raise your hand who are here. I don't have all your... Thank you for being here. This is a busman's holiday. This is a busman's holiday if you happen to come and listen to another elected official. That's above and beyond the call of duty. And also, uh, a Delaware region for the American College of Healthcare Executives, uh, Lynn C. Jones is here, my home. Hey, Lynn, how are you, man? Uh, great to see you. And I have, uh, um, I have not backup, but I have the frontline troops with me here. Secretary Sebelius, former governor of Kansas, is leading our effort here. And the answer, Ann Cabret, Nancy Ann has been leading our fight on this uh, from before uh, we got sworn in, after we got elected, because we started to plan and we knew this was the single biggest priority we had domestically. And Nancy Ann is here as well uh, to uh, answer your questions along. I'm going to ask them both in a moment to say a few words, and, but we want to get, get, get to your questions. You know, uh, um, I look forward to hearing from all of you. And, and you know, we do, we genuinely want to hear your concerns. We're going to do our best to answer the questions you have. But first, with your permission, I'd like to talk uh, about what we're trying to do and what I believe is at stake, what the president and I believe is at stake, and hopefully bring a little perspective to a debate that, to say the least, has been filled with a few misrepresentations, uh, some distortions, and a lot of passion. Um, there's no there, it's totally understandable that there's a lot of passion surrounding this. There's no more important issue. Every time the government has ever talked about health care, since with Harry Truman on, it's generated a lot of passionate uh, concern and, uh, and opinion. So that's legitimate. But there's been, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, most Republicans and Democrats would acknowledge there's been some uh, distortions and some scare tactics about, uh, about, uh, about this debate. Over the course of my, uh, my Senate career, and I got elected uh, when I was 29 years old, I kept my promise to my constituents. The only promise I made that first campaign, as Lynn may remember, is I will get older. Uh, uh, I wasn't old enough to be sworn in, literally, when I got elected. And now I am of your ranks. Uh, and uh, it's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, um, and uh, what a beautiful community, by the way. What a beautiful community. Anyway, uh, but I spent my career. I, I have only 17 senators in all of American history have ever served longer than I had in the Senate. So they tell me, the Senate historian, I think that's the right number. And, uh, and I built a career. Um, protecting and defending Medicare. I would, there are others who know more, who are more articulate, who are better than I was, but no one, no one in the 37 years I was there uh, has fought more for and defended the Medicare system uh, more than I have. Some have done it better, but none more. Now, the reason I say that, I don't say, thank you very much, I don't say that like, yeah, great guy. I just want to put some things, sometimes I think, Younger folks don't quite think of the way we think of these things. Just, I, I kind of look at things in common sense terms here. Why would it be that a guy like me, who fought like the devil, and I mean fought, to prevent the cuts and changes in Medicare in the 80s our friends were trying to do, why would it when guys like me and the folks with me here stood against the cuts in the 90s. Remember back then when Speaker Gingrich, who's a good guy, Newt Gingrich, he's a good, smart guy, just a fundamentally different view of what he had. Remember when those guys, his conservative friends, were hoping to quote, remember, you'll remember the phrase, Medicare would wither on the vine. We're going to let Medicare wither on the vine. Why would folks like us, who put our careers in the line, taking that on, in the 80s and 90s, why would we be doing anything 
anything to weaken the system I've been fighting to protect for 37 years. So I just want to start off with a little bona fides here. I believe, I strongly, strongly believe, and my record will show that I have never done anything other than attempt to strengthen a system. Imagine where we'd be in America. Imagine where we'd be in America today without Medicare. Just imagine the shape we would be in. So ladies and gentlemen, the irony here is that Barack and I, Barack and I are absolutely, totally committed to protecting Medicare, securing that trust fund, and making sure another generation of Americans, as follows our baby boom generation, is able to have Medicare. So if we don't act now, let's just put a few facts on the table here. If we don't act now, the Medicare trust fund that pays for our visits, hospital, all the things that Medicare covers, that Medicare trust fund will be in jeopardy in the year 2017. There ain't going to be enough money in the system in 2017 to provide for all the benefits that are out there now. That's just a fact. Even our opponents will not argue with that fact. So just eight years from now, look, here's the bottom line. You know, you're going to be better off. You, all of us who qualify for Medicare, are going to be better off under the reforms we're proposing, not worse off. As a matter of fact, I went to a moment ago, we will be worse off if we do nothing. Look, it's amazing to me that some of the very voices engaging in these scare tactics and telling you outright lies now, telling you we're going to harm your Medicare, telling you that we are going to have death penalty, all the things you hear, they were nowhere to be heard in the 80s and 90s when we were trying to protect Medicare. I find it fascinating. I find it absolutely fascinating. These guys who wanted to cut Medicare before, these guys who didn't like it in the first place, are now out there telling you that this is the best thing that ever happened since sliced bread. And we, the heirs of the party that produced Social Security, that insisted on Medicare, that we're the ones that are going to gut it. So just step back. Do what we do. Those of us, all of you in the audience, with just common sense, just step back and ask yourself, what do you think? What do you think? You know nothing else about the subject. You just know the guys who were against it the last 20 years are now telling you the guys who were fighting for it for the last 30 years are trying to get rid of it. Come on, man. Come on. I know I'm supposed to be more formal. I'm a vice president. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not kidding. I have a bad habit, as Barbara and Ben will tell you, of saying what's on my mind. The unfortunate part, you'll always know what I think. <laughs> Sometimes I shouldn't tell you what I always think. But all kidding aside, just think of it. Just think of it like educated Americans that you are. It makes no sense. The overall attack, I'll get to the specifics, but the overall assertion that the team that built it is now the team that wants to destroy it, and the team that opposed it is now the team that wants to preserve it. As my little 11-year-old grandchild, Finnegan Biden, would say, Pop, give me a break. <laughs> Look, these folks are the modern incarnation of the intellectual and political voices of yesteryear who warned against government incompetence in setting up Social Security, warned against government takeover and incompetence in setting up Medicare in the first place. I know the arguments against government acting protect, protect our health care. I know what the opponents have said. I've heard it before, and so have you. Here's a direct quote. This is what they said. Quote, we cannot stand idly by now as the nation is urged to embark upon an ill-conceived adventure in government medicine, the end of which no one can see and from which the patient is certain to be the ultimate sufferer. That was said and a lot more. But guess what? That quote I just gave you, that was from Representative Derwood Hall of Missouri in 1964, arguing against the establishment of Medicare. 
These were the warnings that were coming from our Republican friends during those initial debates about Medicare. These were the scare tactics they used to fight tooth and nail to prevent the establishment of Medicare. They sound familiar to you? Do they have kind of an echo you hear now? Look, look at what they said just yesterday. Quote, Americans, especially seniors, can expect delays and denial. The problems of cost and access can be dealt with without the government takeover of health care. End of quote. Second quote yesterday. The plan is a stunning assault on liberty. The plan, the Obama-Biden plan, is a stunning assault on liberty. I'll tell you what's stunning. All of a sudden, these guys are telling you that you and I, many of those who are the heir to the tradition of Social Security and Medicare, that we're out to gut it. We're the ones that are trying to kill it. Because if you listen to add up all the things you're hearing, that's what's basically being said about us, that we're going to gut your Medicare, we're not going to see your doctor, et cetera. Now, look, I think you'll agree with me that the dire warnings of the 60s have proved to be false. Medicare has been an overwhelming success. The patient hasn't turned out to be the ultimate sufferer. Just imagine, as I said earlier, where we'd be today without Medicare, where you'd be today without Medicare. Even though many of you have been very, very successful, I hope have significant pension plans and additional Social Security, even those of you who have done very well financially, where we would be without Medicare. Well, we're hearing the same overheated rhetoric again. We're dealing with the same scare tactics. You may have heard from them that uh, the cutting of the overpayments to insurance companies will cost you your Medicare advantage. 20% of seniors have Medicare advantage. So what I'm hearing now is, because we're going to cut the fat out of the extra bonus we pay insurance companies to provide Medicare advantage, they're going to take it away from you. You're going to lose Medicare advantage. Here's the truth. You'll continue to be able to get Medicare advantage if that's what you choose. And only about, uh, you know, about a quarter of you choose, less than that, choose Medicare Advantage. But those of you who have it, you'll be able to get it. All we're doing is just cutting the padding out of the subsidies that insurance companies are already getting. And you say, why do they get that padding in the first place? Let me just speak Spain English to you. These guys know all the detail. I'm just, I just am a simple guy from Delaware who speaks just plain old English. Here's the deal. You say, well, why did, if this was the case, why, why are they getting this patty? Well, early on, two decades ago, there were a lot of states that didn't have coverage. There were a lot of states that couldn't get extra coverage. There weren't enough insurance companies in there to compete. So we went out there and we said, okay, we're going to give you a real advantage. We're going to give you this kind of a super profit. The government said, we're going to give you a super profit to go in and take care of people who want to have an extra insurance and call Medicare Advantage. And we set it at 14% to attract them in. Well, guess what? Like a lot of other things over the last two decades, we realized it doesn't have to be 14%. We can save billions of dollars by cutting that subsidy, billions of dollars by cutting the subsidy, and they can still make a very good profit. You don't need the extra padding. And you know what we're going to do with that money we're going to save those billions of dollars? We're going to put it back in the Medicare Trust Fund to make sure it remains solvent. They're going to be continue to be able to be profitable plans for insurance companies. We're going after the fat. We're not going after the bone. So this idea that the Obama plan is going to eliminate Medicare Advantage is simply not true. There are more than 40 million seniors in Medicare, more than 10 million in Medicare Advantage. You are a very powerful economic block. The insurance companies aren't going to walk away from making a decent profit from 10 million people. It's bizarre. I love these guys who don't understand free enterprise, who preach it all the time. Why are they going to walk away? 10 million customers. So instead of making 14, you make six or whatever the percentage will be. You're going to leave? 
So folks, again, just common sense. Cut through sort of all the, all, 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 you know, all, 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 all the med speak out there. You know, one, one of the other claims we've heard is we're going to raid Medicare. Folks, that's categorically false. Here's the truth about Medicare under our plan. The President's health care reform plan will protect Medicare. Not a single solitary dollar for this health care plan, this overall health care plan, is going to come out of the Medicare trust fund. Not a single dollar will be used, period. They say we're going to put government between you and your doctor. You've heard that one. You've probably got flyers or something telling you that, right? We're going to put you between you and your doctor. Well, you heard the doc just say how, what, what really puts you between you and your doctor, all the things that are already existing to put you between you and your doctor. But the government bureaucrats, they say, and government panels are going to make your health decision. I walked in. I go home every weekend. My mom won't move to Washington. Um, she likes my house where it is in Wilmington, and uh, she won't come to Washington. And um, so I go home almost every weekend when I'm not abroad. Now, it was uh, about three, four week weekends ago. I walk in, give her a kiss. She said, Joey, what about these death panels? <laughs> and I said, Mom, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> she said, I'm serious, Joey. What about these death panels? I said, Mom, it's hokum. It's a bunch of malarkey. And then I explained it to her. Folks, no one, no one in the government Nobody anywhere, no panel is going to sit down and tell your doctor anything about how to care for you where we're all going to get to at that end of life period. It's malarkey. Can you imagine? Again, the guys that set up Medicare are setting up death panels, right? That's a good deal. Come on. But my mother, it got through. My mother, first thing she asked me. You think I'm joking. You know I'm not joking. You know what you say to your sons and daughters, right? But look, folks, we're going to actually going to give you more power and your doctor more power. We're going to do that by in a couple ways. One, under our plan, preventative care will be cost-free, no copayment. Why are we doing that? Simple reason. We figured it out. Nancy Ann can explain to you better than anybody, as the secretary can. If we keep you healthier longer, you cost less money. It's the morally right thing to do. But if you get to go into preventative care and you're checking it before something bad happens, what happens? You stay healthier longer. It saves the government and you money. So we're going to see to it you don't have any copay. How many of you know somebody who didn't go for preventative care, don't move that thing, folks, uh, um, without, without the fact, without having to ask the question, do I want to pay, uh, you know, the copay for this mammogram? It's a lot of money. I need a colonoscopy. I know I should get one. Nothing wrong with me. I mean, I, I don't know any. I can't, you know, I can't go to a doc and say, you got to order this to me because I, you know, I think I have cancer and I think this is happening because this is, you just want to, you want to know. You should know. How many of you avoid it? <laughs> I know why you guys have avoided it. Uh, I got it. Uh, you know, I'm one of y'all. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, matter of fact, you could pay me and I still don't want to go. Uh, um, but all kidding aside, think about it for real. These are practical things, folks. People don't go to do basic preventative services like mammograms and colonoscopies because of the copay. Now, hopefully you all are in a circumstance where you could afford it even if you, uh, you know, uh, even in your circumstance. But a lot of seniors, they can't afford it. That copay is a big deal. We're going to eliminate the 20 percent of the cost for preventative services you pay now, as I said, for expensive procedures like colonoscopies and mammograms that are necessary, preventatively necessary. Here's something else you need to know. Right now, if we do nothing, there is a scheduled cut of 21% in Medicare payments to doctors that are going to take effect in January. So you go to your doc today, whatever service that is covered under Medicare, I'm going to make this up. Let's say it costs 100 bucks. Lucky if it costs 100 bucks. But it costs 100 bucks, let's say. 
You go to the same doctor for the same procedure on January 20th, the doctor is only going to get, instead of getting reimbursed 100 bucks, the doctor is going to get reimbursed 79 bucks. Why? Because it's scheduled to cut the reimbursement to doctors. Now, what's it have to do with you? Talk about getting between you and your doctor. Guess what? Have Medicare pay your doctor less. The estimates are, and there's no firm estimates, the estimates are that up to 60 percent of the docs will say, I am not going to continue to take as many Medicare patients. I'm going to take a patient who's going to pay me full boat for this, not 21 percent less. Now, the critics will say, and I'll say to the press, every year the Congress has come along when that cut is due to kick in, and led by Ben and Barbara and others, we have said, no, no, we're not going to let that cut happen, and we've come up with the money. But and I might add, parenthetically, a lot of the guys that didn't vote to come up with the money are the very guys telling you we're, they're going to save your Social Security, I mean, your, your Medicare now. But I'm, I'm not making this up, folks. This is real. So if nothing happens, 21 percent cut to your doctors. You want to get between you and your doc? Make sure we don't reimbur we re re reimburse them 20 percent less. Not every doc will walk away, but a whole lot will walk away. So, folks, we're not only not going to get between you and your doctor, we're going to break down barriers between you and your doctor. You're going to have more direct access to your doctor. I also know, you know as well as I do, that a substantial cut in Medicare payments, as I said, is going to, uh, is going to affect your access to your doctors, and we're not going to let that happen. Granted, the Congress, led by the Democrats, probably won't let it happen on a year-to-year -year basis. We just fix this permanently. We should not be doing, having to come up to a crisis every year. Now, look, I know there's a lot of people who say that, uh, as I said, the issue comes up all the time. Congress will do it. But we've got to do it permanently. We're going to, the, the other thing you hear is we're going to ration care based on age. Uh, death panels, which I referenced earlier. Nothing in any of the proposed reforms will put government in charge of end-of-life decisions. There are no death penalties. It's a scare tactic. It's a lie. It's flat out not true. Now, given all that's been said about health care over the past months, uh, here's the thing that amazes me most. It's not what our opponents talk about that's scary. It's what they don't talk about that's scary. Here's what they don't talk about. They don't talk about what happens if we do nothing. Without reform, health care inflation will continue to rise. What's it been over the last eight years, like 50, 49 percent or something over the last seven or eight years? Inflation will continue to rise. The deficit will increase. And as I said earlier, in about a decade, the Medicare trust fund will fall into the red. Without reform, more than 8 million seniors who drug coverage stops after the initial spending limit due to what you all know as the donut hole, the gap between 2700 and 6200 bucks will continue to face financial hardship until, God forbid, the catastrophic limit is faced over well over $6,000. Under our plan, no more. Not with our plan. Our reforms cut in half the amount seniors will pay for drugs that they get caught in that donut hole. So if you get caught in that donut hole and you're having to pay out of pocket two grand, you'll pay one grand. If you're paying 500, you'll pay 250. If you're paying 2,000, you'll pay 1,000 over the next 10 years. And eventually, we completely eliminate the donut hole. No one else is proposing that that I'm aware of. Look, folks, let me put this in perspective. I laid out why some of the assertions are false, and I want to get to your questions. I want to hear from my colleagues. But let, look, let's look at the big picture. Over the next 10 years, just put this in perspective, over the next 10 years, Medicare is going to pay out over $6 trillion. Hear me now? Over the next 10 years, over six, I think it's 6.3 trillion, don't hold me, over $6 trillion. And what we're talking about is finding $500 billion in savings, less than 7%. And we're going to find those savings in a whole range of ways that will in no way affect your Medicare, no way affect your benefits, no way affect your access. And I mentioned a few by we're doing away with the super premium on that we pay insurance companies for, uh, for Medicare Advantage. But let me give you one other example that no reason why you should know about this. 
just give you one because there's a lot. I could go through it all, but I'm taking too long already because we want to hear from you. Right now, folks, we pay hospitals a premium in a Medicare payment. Not because they're doing something wrong, because we know hospitals have to take a lot of indigent patients, a lot of elderly, uh, I mean, a lot of people who are just indigent. They can't pay. So we decided a long, long time ago that in addition to paying Medicare uh, to doctors and hospitals for services provided for you, we gave those hospitals an extra amount of money that they need and deserve in order to be able to care for a population that has no insurance at all. Roughly how much do we pay them, Nancy Ann? Several million bucks. Yeah, it's several billion bucks a year. Now, the reason we're going to be able to save the money, the, uh, the $500 billion over the next 10 years, one example, is under our plan, over 90% of the American public are going to have health insurance. So the hospitals aren't going to need that subsidy anymore. Not because we're penalizing them, because now the indigent person walks in and he or she has health insurance. It's being paid for, not through Medicare, over the overall health care plan we're proposing. So we can cut the vast majority of the payments we're making to hospitals. Just like we're going to cut the overpayment we are paying to uh, um, insurance companies for Medicare Advantage. Just like the billions of dollars we're going to save by beefing up, which we've been arguing for for a long time, the Justice Department's effort to go after waste and fraud. Justice Department just settled a suit against one of the major companies in the country for two point, what? $2.3 billion in fraud paid back into the fund. Now, a lot of you are businessmen and women, work for big corporations. Any place you couldn't find somewhere 2 3% in fraud in that outfit? What do you think? <laughs> or waste? So, folks, keep it in perspective. Over $6 trillion bucks going out, $500 billion over 10 years being saved. Nobody is going to mess with your benefits. No one. All we do is make it better for people on Medicare. That is the truth of the matter. You may not like other parts of our plan. You may not like some aspects of what we're talking about. But as it relates to Medicare, as it relates to Medicare, we're the guys that fought for it. We're the guys who are going to keep it. We're the guys who are going to make it better. Don't buy this malarkey. Now, look. Let's look back at the 60s one more time. Back then, it took a special group of concerned Americans to cut through all the clutter, the nonsense, and the outright fiction that was coming from those who opposed Medicare in the 60s. It took a special group to work with President Kennedy and then President Johnson to stand up and fight for quality care for older Americans. That group was the National Council of Senior Citizens. And that group of concerned and engaged seniors spoke out to show America in no uncertain terms that Medicare would improve the lives of seniors for generations to come. Now, I know this is leisure world, but I also know, I also know what the people are here. I don't know you particularly. I don't know you individually, but I know the spirit. I know that you can fight like hell for things that you believe in. Yeah. And I know. I know right now we need you to stand up and fight for Medicare again. Fight through the lies. Fight for what's right for you, for your children, and for your grandchildren, and for the generations of Americans to come to make sure they have the benefit, the benefit that we have had, our generation, coming from Medicare. I thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. Let me yield for a moment now, if I may. Do you want to stand here, Gov? Let me give you uh, to, uh, to Governor Sebelius, Secretary Sebelius. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to have a chance to join the Vice President uh, here at Leisure World and to be with my great partner, Nancy Ann DeParl, who is the uh, President's point person inside the White House on health reform. And just to tell you, who we are. I am the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which means our office runs Medicare. Um, I have a 88-year-old dad who checks on me on a regular basis, like uh, 
Joe's mom checks on him. And I can guarantee you, uh, Medicare is near and dear to my heart because I know the kinds of great care he receives uh, from that system. Nancy Ann, who may not tell you this herself, used to run Medicare services inside the Department of Health and Human Services. So we uh, have an eye on uh, what the benefits provide and how incredibly important it is. And I have to tell you, even if we got slightly off track, Senators Cardin and Mikulski and Congressman Van Hollen would put us right back on track. So there isn't a chance that we're going to lose the uh, framework of this very important program. The Vice President has done a great job uh, talking about what's, what's going to happen positively about Medicare. And I've got to tell you, it's one of the biggest enhancements to the program uh, that has happened in a long time. No more out-of-pockets for preventive care. What we know is three of five women don't get a mammogram from age 50 on. That's a dangerous place to be because then breast cancer isn't identified early and isn't taken care of. Two of five men don't get a colonoscopy on a regular basis. Again, not a great place to be because both of those tests indicate if something is a problem and can be taken care of, and that's very important. Um, to make it clear about the doctor cut that's looming on the horizon, the 21% decrease in physician fees, that's not part of the health reform plan. That's a carryover of an old law that was put in place by the last administration that's looming. And so Congress has to act to change that law. And that's part of health reform, to get rid of the cut in doctors. Because as the Vice President said, if anything will get rid of your doctor, it's a 21% pay cut. Uh, standing between you and that doctor visit. So I just wanted to make it clear that has been part of the old law. It needs to change, and part of the health reform package is to change that. And there are people who talk about the fact that fraud and abuse isn't real, and you're not going to get any savings from fraud and abuse. Uh, just since President Obama and Vice President Biden were sworn into office just since January, in the last eight months, there has been approximately $3 billion worth of fraud and abuse that has been identified, prosecuted, and returned to the system. That's just in eight months. So don't let anybody, you're right. These folks take very seriously the notion that somebody's stealing from taxpayer dollars, somebody stealing out of these very critical programs. And they've asked the Attorney General and me to work together at a cabinet level, never been done before, to crack down on these folks. So we've expanded hit squads in Detroit and Houston and places around the country where we see billing patterns that make no sense, where people literally are inventing services that never got delivered and never got billed for. And you just heard the largest settlement in history against a drug company who was marketing a drug against the law, telling citizens across this country that the drug would do a whole series of things that it didn't do. They'd been told specifically by the Food and Drug Administration that they couldn't market that way and turned right around and did it anyway. And not only did they get fined for $2.3 billion dollars, and were actually making money illegally, but they were jeopardizing lives. They were giving information that's just flat out false. So there were people on Medicare and on Medicaid who were receiving this drug and a handful of other drugs that actually didn't do what it said it was gonna do. So you trust your doctor to prescribe a drug that's good for you that would reduce pain, and this drug did not do what it said it was gonna do. They knew it didn't. They'd had clinical trials saying it didn't, and instead went out and did it anyway. So those are the kinds of things that health reform will help crack down on. Um, we have done a couple of things recently, uh, also I think that can greatly enhance Medicare services. One of the things that happens a lot, and I saw it with my own parents, is that while you get to see a doctor, too often there's not a lot of follow-up care. So patients get admitted to the hospital. Right now, one in five of those patients is back in the hospital in 30 days. Sometimes that, you know, something else happens in the 30 days and you desperately need to go back. But a lot of times there's been no follow-up care. Did you fill your medication? Are you feeling okay? Is there any sign of a temperature or something going on? 
that can be followed up on quickly, taken care of, and actually prevent somebody from going back into the hospital. I don't know about the rest of you, but I know my mom, who was in and out of the hospital for a couple of years before she died in 1996, hated to go back into the hospital. She would wanted to be at home, wanted to feel better, wanted to take care of herself. But uh, So part of what we've done is say that uh, we think a health team with some community folks who actually visit patients who have come out of the hospital, work with people on follow-up care, make phone calls, uh, follow up on treatments, can not only cut down on those hospitalizations, which cuts costs, but also it's much better for patients. It's much better for folks who may have a question about their medication, may want to ask a few questions, but now don't have that opportunity. So there are a whole series of things that I think will deliver better care at a lower cost, and it's one of the reasons we're promoting it. Finally, you hear from a lot of people who say, well, you know, if Medicare is scheduled to be broke in 2017, why in the world would we add anything, add anybody to the health system? If you can't run Medicare, why in the world would you try to run anything else? Well, let me tell you one of the reasons that Medicare is scheduled to be out of money. Uh, the prescription drug benefit that was added six years ago is a big help to most seniors, desperately needed. No one would write a plan like Medicare in this day and age and say, well, you don't have any drug coverage. So it was long overdue. But guess what? The folks who passed that and the previous administration didn't pay for it. So they took it out of the deficit. They took it out of the Medicare trust fund. There is not a dime paid for of that prescription drug benefit, which has cost billions and billions of dollars. What this president and vice president say is we're not going to do that. Any health plan that passes is going to be paid for. It's important that we not just assume that we can add on the benefit side and kind of make it up on the pay for side. So part of the debate going on in Congress right now is making sure that whatever passes is actually paid for. Uh, and that, I think, will make sure that the plans are there going forward. Um, before I turn over uh, to Nancy Ann DeParle, I want to do just a 20-second health update on the flu, because uh, we're also working on the new flu and the seasonal flu, and I just don't want to lose this opportunity. Um, seasonal flu vaccine is available right now. And so I would urge anyone who gets a seasonal flu shot year in and year out to go ahead and get it right now. Uh, it's available earlier than usual because uh, we wanted to accelerate that production to make sure we had a, a, the capacity to also deal with the new vaccine, the H1N1 vaccine. So we asked manufacturers to speed up. And I know there's a lot of questions, and I get them all the time. If I get my seasonal flu shot in September, is it going to last until February, March, April, when I might get the flu? Absolutely. Um, the seasonal flu, we know what we're targeting, and so that vaccine is good for the whole flu season. And so I would urge you to take advantage of it and get it now. The new vaccine for the virus that was just identified in April, first, there will be plenty for everybody. So we would encourage anyone who, uh, again, is going to get a vaccine to get ready to get that. The vaccine will start to be available in mid-October. The good news for senior citizens is we know that this new flu targets younger people, that the people most likely to get the flu, most likely to get very sick from the flu, most likely to have dangerous conditions as a result of the flu, are actually age 25 and under. Scientists still can't tell us why there seems to be a built-in immunity from senior citizens, but it may be that uh, previous flu shots, it may be previous flu seasons, but what we're seeing is a lot less uh, older Americans getting this new flu. Uh, having said that, we still would encourage everybody to, to get a shot. Um, Kids will be on the top priority list when the vaccine starts to flow, just because they're most likely to get very sick from the flu. But we want to make sure that seniors understand there is plenty of vaccine, thanks to the activities of the Congress. The House and Senate said the most important thing, they agreed with the president, the most important thing is safety and security of the American public. We don't know how serious this flu is going to be, so we want to make sure there's plenty of vaccine. It will be available. 
Um, and I just wanted to tell you that get your seasonal flu shot now, and then later this fall, make sure and get the H1N1 shot. It won't conflict with each other, but it's a, it's a new virus. And the best way to keep from getting the flu of any kind is to take some steps to prevent it. And we want to work with you to do just that. And now I'd like to uh, turn this over to Nancy Ann DeParl, who is the uh, White House uh, Director of Health Reform and works very closely with not only our department, but the President and the Vice President to try and push this legislation forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you, Madam Secretary, for your leadership and for all you're doing to help make health care reform a reality. And I'm a proud Marylander. I live not very far from here. I'm not sure you're going to be able to say it. <laughs> Maybe I need a riser here. Uh. Uh, Senator, you uh, understand this, work. don't you? I, you uh, do. Here, well, I might just sit right here and sit here. Come on, this way. That way, you know, the people in the middle can't see you. All right. <laughs> was, now, can people okay. see me? In the they can't see you. All right. So, we're all right. <laughs> so, Thank you for helping make health care reform a reality and for everything you're doing. Back in August, when everybody was on vacation, I called the vice president and said, we need to get you out there and, and help us explain health care reform because, as he said, there were a lot of, lot of myths out there, a lot of uh, misrepresentations, and, and you're just great at, at uh, helping to explain them. So thank you so much. Thank you. And as I said, I'm a proud Marylander. Uh, I live not too far from here, and so I'm really proud to be working with our two senators, Senator Mikulski and Senator Cardin, who have just been stalwarts working for seniors and working for health care reform, and they're just terrific, and I'm proud to have my congressman, Chris Van Hollen, here as well. And I just want to thank them for everything they're doing. As the vice president and the secretary said, we're already closer to making health care reform a reality than we've ever been before. And as... as Thanks. And as he said, we've been at this now since at least President Truman. Some would say President Teddy Roosevelt. We've been working to try to make this a reality in our country. We haven't. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but we are closer than ever before. In fact, just this week, uh, the last committee that needs to act on it is, is marking up a bill. So we're excited about that. Uh, we're here to talk to you about it. We appreciate your making time today to talk to us. Um, I just want to be the third person up here to reassure you that under President Obama's plan, we will strengthen Medicare. And you heard him. I hope many of you were able to hear him in the, his joint session addressed to Congress um, about a week ago. And he said, we will protect Medicare. And I think you know uh, that this president and this vice president and this secretary of HHS will protect Medicare. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, folks, uh, um, I, uh, I've been trained uh, on the Senate floor that uh, before I do anything else, Barbara, you have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Mr. Yeah, that's Mr. Vice President. First of all, speaking for Team Maryland, we want to welcome you to Montgomery County. And the visual world. We in Montgomery County, for you and your health care team, we're proud to have NIH here. We're proud to have FDA here. We're proud to have you here. <laughs> uh, we wanted to be sure to acknowledge uh, County Executive Ike Leggett and members of the County Council. You know, Leisure World, Nancy knows about it, but this is the most civically engaged voter participating <laughs> spot in all of Maryland. But we're glad you're here with your usual plain talk, straight talk. And let me get to my question, which I've heard. I've now, for those of you who see me here, sitting so demurely <laughs> in a wheelchair, um, coming out of, the good news was I was in church. 
The bad news was I fell coming out of church and broke my ankle in three places. So during the last six weeks, I've seen health care from the wheelchair up and have been with many of constituents uh, in rehab and other settings. But here's what they're asking, and we'll elaborate. When they, first of all, we're from the generation where money really means something. Uh, and when we hear things like trillion, it takes our breath away. Six trillion, my gosh. Uh, and then we hear billions. Um, so when we hear these big numbers, they're frightening. And as I've heard when, the, when I sat in physical therapy, when I was going through my x-rays and all of this, they said, how can you cut Medicare by $400 billion and not cut these services? And when they broke it down to 40 or $50 billion a year, so it wasn't gonna be like a one-year thing, but 40 or $50 billion, they really are skeptical and suspicious and are afraid that they're gonna lose their benefit or afraid that they will lose their doctor because their doctor is not being reimbursed. Could you come back, Mr. Vice President, or your team to really go over that 50 billion bucks? We heard about waste and fraud. You and I have campaigned on waste and fraud a long time. That, you know, there is that there, but we really, I think, need to hear specifically, are there going to be a shrinking or an elimination of benefits, or are our providers going to be so shrunk that we're going to lose our providers? So we don't want to lose our, people don't want to lose their Medicare, and they don't want to lose their provider. And trillions are enough to take your breath away. Well, as usual, Barb, you went right to the heart. But look, uh, break it down. Over 10 years, it's $50 billion a year in, quote, savings we're going to find. That's still a lot of money. Uh, uh, and uh, the way we're going to do it, and uh, I, we, we can go into specifics, but start off, we're going to make sure that the Medicare Advantage, the super subsidy, is not paid. That is about how much money? 100. Yeah. So it's $14 billion a year. That's $14 billion to the 50. Then you have the hospitals uh, who are don't, will not need to be reimbursed because we will have more people covered, and that's several more billion, is that correct? Yes, sir, and the hospitals worked with us on what made sense, as you right. said. As right. we get more people insured, they don't need the money for that, so they, right. they worked with us on and it. And there are no doctor fee cuts whatsoever. In fact, I would tell you that doctors are terrified of what is in the current law that's facing them, which is a 21% cut, which gets fixed in health reform, so absolutely no cuts. And Mr. Vice President, one of the things to answer the senator is that right now, as the vice president said, about 20% of Americans, about 20% of the 43 million Americans who have Medicare services choose the so-called Medicare Advantage plans. But everybody pays the extra amount for Medicare Advantage plans. Everybody pays, uh, we estimate it's about $90 uh, per Medicare beneficiary, even if you don't get Medicare Advantage, you're paying that extra cost. So bringing those costs down, again, will actually help every senior, not only the seniors who choose Medicare Advantage, but the seniors who don't, because you're paying an extra cost right now for what has proven to be not additional health benefits, just an overpayment required uh, to bring the private companies in. They're gonna stay in. I just looked at the plans for next year, uh, Medicare Advantage companies are definitely staying in the program. They're just going to make less of a subsidized profit. And again, that's a, that's a fairly significant amount of the dollars. But those dollars, or the drug dollars, bringing down the donut hole costs, are coming right back into the Medicare plan. They're not going to pay for anybody else. They're actually making Medicare stronger into the future. Questions from the audience. We got folks out here with microphones. Uh, why don't you give that gentleman right there the white shirt? He's got a pen in his pocket, which always worries me. Uh, yes. He probably ran a company, and I'm in trouble. You mentioned Medicare, which is an excellent program. It's a government program, and the biggest. Uh, and but there are a lot of other things in the program which you said are. No, it's on. You just got to hold it sort of. Oh, okay. That's it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, Medicare is an excellent program. 
uh, but there are a lot of other parts of the health care reform program which are going to be controversial and be difficult, perhaps, to pass. Let's pass, why don't we try passing it in parts? For example, the Medicare is a great program. There are 40 million uninsured. Bring the 40 million under Medicare, and then that'll cut out the emergency uh, room visits and all that. And, and um, that should, uh, as one step in the way to get health care reform. That is music to the ears of an awful lot of members of the United States Congress who say that, look, what we ought to have is Medicare for everybody. Uh, they call that a single-payer system. They, and then that gets attacked by saying, well, that's Canadian socialized medicine and so on and so forth. So um, uh, part of what I have learned in uh, my years in uh, the United States Senate is that, that politics is the art of the possible. And what we have to do is figure out how we can ensure more people do it in a cost-effective way that it doesn't break the bank, break the budget, and do it in a way that, in fact, can get 51% of the members of the Congress to vote for it. And so the reason I talk so much about Medicare today is, and I'll be really blunt with you, that the polling data shows that the people who enjoy the best-run government program in Medicare are the most skeptical about this because of all the things that were said about how we're gonna undo the Medicare program. The usual overwhelming allies for healthcare reform historically have been seniors, people who in fact understand. I mean, those who, look, I have, uh, I have my own little, uh, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been a significant consumer of healthcare. I've had two cranial aneurysms, one major embolism. I was hospitalized for seven months. I lost a daughter and a wife. I had two sons very badly injured. My medical bills, if you add them up, were literally well into the millions. Not a joke. I mean, me alone, uh, my seven months with two embolisms, cranial aneurysms, and one embolism, uh, by today's dollars have been estimated by docs as somewhere about eight hundred to $900,000. Um, so I understand the consumption side. Uh, I've laid in an ICU unit for 59 days, looking at those little meters and wondering whether they're going to stop. And wonder, you know, <laughs> so, some of you have been there. You know what I mean? You, you kind of look at them like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I hope that thing keeps bouncing that way. You know, I mean, you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. If anybody's been through it, you know what I'm talking about. So I get it. I get it because the older we get, the more we consume. You know, it's, it's the nature of the human body. Um, but my point is this. The reason why we focus so much on Medicare today with the most powerful group in America. Look, you are the most, we are the most powerful group of in America. We vote more than anybody else does. We, we, we voted a higher percentage. We're more informed. We're engaged. And so the first thing to do here is to put at rest some of the things that are just simply not true about the system. Like my mom doesn't ask me, Joey, what about death panel? She knows it's malarkey, but it had to be responded to. So that's the reason why we focus today on Medicare. There are a lot of other aspects of this program, but the key part to know about the overall health care proposal that we are proposing is that we pay for it. Number one, we don't do what we did in the prescription drug benefit, which is to add over years a trillion dollars to all those costs and just pile them on and wonder where the money's going to come from and wonder why things are going bankrupt. We want to pay for it. And number two, we want to do it in a way that continues to give people absolute choice to be able to determine their doctor, what insurance. We're not putting insurance companies out of business. I made a speech yesterday, or day, yeah, yesterday, um, on the other aspect of healthcare. And I talked about how what we're doing, we want shareholders of insurance companies to get a return on their investment, for real, not a joke. We just don't want them to be able to engage in practices that are just simply unfair. Give you a case in point. You, I'm sure you know somebody, God forbid, maybe your son or your daughter, who had a health insurance coverage 
when they're with their firm that they work for. They work for a big or small company. They have their health care. They, they, for what they were forego increase in their salary for the increase in health care benefits. So, you know, they got a health care plan from their company. And then they, uh, they ended up, they've had uh, a breast cancer, which was dealt with, or prostate cancer, which was dealt with and under their plan. Then their company goes bankrupt and they lose their job. And then they also lose their health care. Although we've extended COBRA, they lose their health care. Now they go out to buy health care. Now, guess what? They're 49 years old. They go to buy health care. They got a family. They're a head of household, man or woman. And they say, I want to get health care. And they say, but you had breast cancer. Or you had prostate cancer. Or you have, you know, uh, diverticulitis. You have, you have a pre-existing condition. We ain't covering you. And in order to be able to get covered, it's astronomical. Astronomical the cost. They can't afford it. You know, people are paying, families of four are paying roughly, what is it, 13500 bucks a year if they have to do it individually. Right now, back in, 2000, in 1999, I think the number was like 4000 or 3200 they were paying. The costs have just gone crazy. And so what we want to say is, look, here's the deal. If we make you insurance company A, don't you wish you owned one of those insurance companies? Insurance company A, we don't expect you to pick up the people who are sicker, while insurance company B just has cherry picks and only has healthy people. But guess what? If you are all the insurance companies in America, and we say to all, to do business in America, you all have to cover pre-existing conditions. Then guess what? Nobody. You're not at a disadvantage. Company A is not at a disadvantage of Company B. They're all in the same place, every one of them. And then they come along and they say, okay, well, but what you're going to do is we're not going to make as much money per patient that way. I say, that's right, but here's what's going to happen. Here, here's what's going to happen. We're going to insure another 30 to 40 million people who will have insurance. So guess what? you got 30 or 40 million, more million people walking in buying your policy. So what you lose in the individual profit, you pick up in the mass market you're picking up. If you notice, a lot of docs, excuse me, doc, for saying this, a lot of docs in the 60s opposed Medicare. Guess what? They love it now. Why? Because you got 40 million Americans able to pay. If you didn't have, if you didn't have Medicare today, how many seniors would be able to pay for the health care they have? Hopefully all of you would. You live in a, you've all done well. I'm not being critical. I'm being complimentary. You and me, we'd be able to do it. But I tell you what, there's a whole lot of people who wouldn't be able to pay. Docs are doing okay. And they should. So the point I'm trying to make here is, I want you to think about the common sense of what we're trying to do here. This is not rocket science in a sense. So we want to say you can't have pre, you, you, you can't tell people, guess what? You've already spent 60,000 bucks on you. That's it. We're not going to spend any more. You can't put caps. You can't discriminate between women and women, men and women in the policies. There are a whole set of basic rules we want to set out there to level the playing field, to make it fair, to make sure that people aren't going to be put at a disadvantage. But the point I'm making to you is when you hear about this socialized medicine stuff, these guys are still going to do great. Nobody's saying we don't want them to make a profit. We do. You know, there are a lot of people who have stock in insurance companies. You should be able to get a return on your investment. But we got to do it in a rational way so that people, in fact, can get more coverage. We can lower costs. Anyway, that's, there, there's a whole lot to talk about the overall plan, if you want to ask specifics about it. I'm going to stop answering questions uh, so we can get some real answers here. And I'll answer your phone. I can't find mine either. Uh, I don't know where the hell mine is. Uh, do I have my glasses on? <laughs> now <laughs> that would surprise that? somebody. Where are my glasses? And they're on top of my head. I, I tell you, my wife is. Uh, my, my wife teaches full time at Northern Virginia Community College now. She used to teach at Delaware Community College, and she's teaching full time now. And she has a purse like. A lot of you ladies have purses. And when that phone rings, it takes about 20 minutes to go through it. I say, for God's sake, Jill, why don't you put a little pouch in the side or something? 
And then mine will be ringing. She said, Joe, your phone's ringing. I said, I can't hear it. <laughs> so, you know, so what the hell? I don't know, man. Ain't life wonderful? Uh, okay, questions over here. Question uh, right here. The lovely lady in the black sweater, or black butt. Can we get that? Here you go. Assuming we have, and I'm sure we will, the passage of health care legislation, I'm told that there w it will take four years for there to be significant imp uh, for the plan to become, yes, and four years is a long time for someone my age. Why does it take so long? Well, you will be 58 by the time it kicks in. <laughs> uh, I know that. What do you complain about your age? Look at you. Give me a break. Four years. Four years, you'll probably still be jogging. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm going to ask the secretary to answer that question. Um, you're absolutely right. Some of the plan will be phased in, and, and part of what they're talking about taking a while is setting up a new health market, primarily for folks who don't have insurance at all. That just will take a while to get the private plans into the market, to have a competitive option to design a benefit package. Some of this will start right away. So, for instance, uh, lower drug costs start next year. Uh, some of the preventive care issues to get copays out of the way start next year. Uh, some of the opportunities to strengthen Medicare start right away. It's really the new marketplace uh, that won't uh, start immediately just because we need to make sure it works well when it starts. So the plan is actually phased in over a period of time, but a lot of the benefit side to existing programs and some of the lower costs actually kick in year one. You all know what the marketplace is, what we mean by that? It's sound, I mean, it's, uh, all, all, all the marketplaces is you, you know, if you worked for a big company like in my home state, DuPont, you know, you paid less for the same coverage you got if you worked for DuPont, and DuPont paid less than, uh, than, than Smith Camera Shop that had 10 employees, why? DuPont had thousands and thousands of employees, so when insurance companies bid for their business, they say, look, we're not going to pay five cents an aspirin, we're only going to pay four cents. And so they say, okay, God, I got 17 or 20 or 100,000 people out there, so I'll make a deal. I get all those people, I will charge less for that that aspirin, fig figuratively speaking, or the VA system. We got 17 million people in the VA system. The VA sits down and they negotiate. They say, okay, look, uh, if, we, if you insurance company are gonna provide for these services, we're only gonna pay uh, X dollars, not X plus one. And the insurance company does it, why? They get 17 million customers. They make a little less in each customer, but they get 17 million. But if you go all by yourself to get health care, or you're a small business person to get health care for you and your employees, the costs are incredibly high. So what these markets are is we're going to go out there and say, look, here's the deal. You want to join this exchange. You, you want to walk in and eventually join a lot of other people. And so, and we say to all the insurance companies, anybody who wants to go get insurance, and, and the people without insurance are going to be able to get subsidized a little bit in this. You're going to be able to go in and you're going to band together and it'll be 20 million people. And 20 million people will then, and we'll say any insurance company that wants to sell insurance to those 20 million people in this exchange, they call it, then guess what? You got to abide by basic rules. And here's the rules you got to abide by if you want to sell in this thing. And then what happens is people go in and say, okay, now I can negotiate. I'm part of 20 million. So here's what I'm going to buy, and your insurance will be less than you pay for it all by yourself. That's one of the ways to get people who aren't covered now, or people who have coverage, especially small businesses, where they're paying an awful lot of money. Look, most small business people want to do the right thing. They want to give their employees health insurance, but they can't afford it. The costs are gigantic. So that's what an exchange is. It's kind of like everybody getting together, a bigger group to bargain, and all the insurance companies who want to get in and sell to you all, they got to buy by all the same rules, and your cost for, the, for a good policy will be down compared to you going out all by yourself. But it takes time to set that up. Uh, gentlemen, all the way in the back at the time. Uh, Mr. Biden, I want to welcome you to the 
best, most active, fun place to live for seniors in the national capital area. Will you invite me back to swim or something? And, I mean, other than talk. And even though your mom doesn't want to live in Washington, she'd have a great time here. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you if you could tell us the real skinny and explain to us why so many people are upset over the notion of the PO, the public option. Well, I think, it, again, I think it's one of these things blown way out of proportion. What the argument is, is that in the best, the most logical argument is, look, if you give people backup, a lot of states, there's not a lot of insurance companies competing. You know, like in Maryland, which is one of the wealthiest states, and by the way, I think you were picked, aren't you? I saw a thing the other day. Number one, it's the highest average income of any state in America. You did a good job, Barbara. I, uh, um, I, used, I used to think Delaware was. We aren't even in the top four. It's New Jersey, you, New Jersey, Connecticut, and somewhere else. But my point is, in some states where there's a lot of people able to pay, and there's a density of population, a lot of insurance companies come in and compete. In other states that are more rural and smaller and the rest, it's hard to get insurance companies to come in and compete. They're just not, you know, I guess there's not enough business. So the point is that one of the things that's going on here is we say, look, in order to keep insurance companies honest so that they're not charging exorbitant rates, there ought to be a public option out there. If you can't go out and find uh, the kind of health care that you can afford because it's not being offered in your state or it's not being offered where you live or you can't get to it. Um, uh, I didn't like my answer, I guess. Uh, um, that what will happen is there should be another option for you. You should be able to go out and buy insurance through a not, not, not a existing insurance company. Why, why don't you explain the public option? Well, the, the public option would just be a government-sponsored option that would be available competing alongside the private sector plans. And as you say, it's been sort of mystifying to all of us as to why it's gotten so much attention and why people are, you know, I guess I understand why some insurance companies wouldn't like it because they don't necessarily want the competition, but it's been blown up out of proportion. Secretary Sebelius, when she and I first talked about it, said, well, we have a plan kind of like that in Kansas. It works great. It operates alongside the other plans. Some people choose it, some people don't. It helps keep the marketplace honest. It's a, it's a comparison to look at. They don't have to make a profit, so you're, the costs are a little bit lower. The administrative costs are lower. They're not underwriting to pick the healthy people out, et cetera. So it's a good option out there. And we actually looked at it because people were saying, this will be a government takeover and hundreds of millions of people will be in this thing. Uh, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office estimates, uh, we believe that only about 5% of Americans would even choose to be in this, you know, if it exists. So uh, we think it's not something to be feared. It's something that would help the marketplace operate better. But as you say, it's gotten a lot more attention uh, than other aspects of the plan for some reason. The other thing I'd say, is just to get to the core of it, when you want to defeat an overall plan or a position that you don't like, it's best to take the thing that is the most inflammatory, even though it's your least concern, and use that as an argument against the whole thing. So it is true. Some insurance company thinks that will cut into their profits. If you're able to go to, a, to an insurance company that's going to provide you a decent health care plan because you can't find one or afford one in the market and they're not make, they don't have to make a profit, it's a not-for-profit operation, that that's going to force the insurance companies to be more reasonable. They're going to make them more competitive. And they don't like that. But the truth is, it's really, I think, a lot more than. It's an easy thing to call government uh, takeover. When you talk about a plan out there that is one that is sponsored by the government, even though it doesn't make any profit, has to pay, has to make its premiums, meet its pay. I mean, it has to be a, you know, break even. It's not being subsidized. That is easy to say, hey, look, this is a new way of the government trying to get in and get rid of all these private insurance companies and have government take over of everything. But I don't think it's so much that the insurance companies really believe it's going to hurt them. I think it is a convenient way to say public option is socialized medicine, public option is government takeover, when all it is 
is another option that has to meet, it, it has, has to have a bottom line that comes out even every year. It doesn't have to make a profit. It has to come out and pay for itself and cover, the premiums have to cover the coverage they provide. Um, but it's just to give people an option where some places there's only one or two companies that are competing in the state. I mean, it's, it's, but it's blown way out of proportion. I don't think it's so much about the public option as if it's a mystifying term and it's able to be used in a way to make people think that this is really overall a government takeover, an assault on Medicare, and a, you know, government socialized medicine. We're going to be like Russia. You know, I mean, freedom is at stake, you know, all that. Mr. Vice President, the only thing I would add to that is I think that there were a number of people, and I'm sure uh, Senator Mikulski and Senator Cardin heard from them. I'm sure Congressman Van Hollen heard. There are people who think we should have a single-payer program. You know, that would be the best way. Get rid of all the private insurance. I see there are people here who feel that. What I think President Obama knew was that about 180 million Americans have insurance provided through their jobs. They like their doctor, they like their plan, they think it does well by them and their family. So rather than starting with dismantling what works for some people, the best alternative would be to give some cost competition and choice for folks who either don't have coverage at all or don't have coverage that actually covers what they need, the so-called underinsured. So if you get hit by a bus, you might have some payment, but basically day in and day out, you don't have anything. So actually the public option is part of this marketplace to give competition to the private insurers and choice to consumers, some free market principles that actually work pretty well. It doesn't dismantle anything, it just adds an additional factor uh, to the puzzle. Question in the bell, take a couple more questions. No one in the back's gotten a chance yet. Would you go up there and I can't see, the gentleman right there. Thank you very much. Also, I want to welcome you to Leisure World, and your mother would be very welcome here. <laughs> um, as we expand through the President's plan, the number of uninsured, uh, we probably won't have enough physicians. It takes a long time to train a physician, and the physicians that are being trained now are not going into primary, uh, uh, internal medicine. They're going into the specialties. I understand, I'm told that in countries such as Canada, England, maybe Israel and some others, where they have fairly universal medical care, it can be a very long time before you get service for some conditions. Uh, could you address that, please? Thank you. Madam and Secretary. we very well, much welcome you here, and all of you. I think that is a great question. And again, I think there's a lot of... Um, concern about what happens. Um, Mr. Vice President, you look right at home. <laughs> surrounded by beautiful women. The Vice President lives a life surrounded by beautiful they, women. So it's... They invited your mom, I think. It was yeah. <laughs> you could bring your mom. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the senators and House members recognized was we are looking at a health care provider shortage, regardless of what happens. So part of the Recovery Act that was passed as one of the first bills that the president signed and actually that the vice president oversees the funding of and makes sure that the money's going to the right place and paying for the programs is an increase in uh, medical providers. We need more docs. We need more physicians. We need more mental health technicians. We need more dentists. So a portion of that Recovery Act money is helping pay off scholarships, encouraging more kids to actually go to medical school in the first place and knowing that they don't have to end up with debt, encouraging more nurses, more nursing teachers. So that pipeline, filling that pipeline is already underway. Uh, the second thing that happens right now is a lot of people get health care, even if they don't have health insurance, they get health care, but they come through the doors of an emergency room, or they wait until they're sicker and in more serious condition. Part of having an insurance coverage provided for everyone, part of getting a health home for everyone, is that actually it can use the health system more correctly. So 
the hospital and emergency rooms will be used for those folks who really need acute care, who really need those practices, and get people to get preventive care at a much earlier stage. Fewer people ending up sicker, fewer people ending up with hospitalization. So in many ways, I think it's one of the reasons that doctors are very enthusiastic. A lot of doctors are seeing those patients right now, but they don't get to treat them at an earlier stage. They don't get to apply appropriate medical care. So I think that there are a lot of physicians who tell me when I visit with them around the country, actually having uh, health care for everyone means that they would actually go back to being doctors once again. The third piece of the puzzle, which again is part of the Recovery Act, is helping to use technology to cut down on the paperwork. I don't know how many of you love to fill out how many of you visit a doctor's office and the first thing that happens is you get the clipboard, the infamous clipboard with the form and, you know, and I don't know how many times you've told people what your name really is and what your dress is and what your blood type is, but over and over again and you're a total stranger the next time you come in and you fill out the clipboard all over again. That also happens to doctors. When they try to get paid right now in some of this crazy system, they file claims over and over again. They have 15 gazillion ways that they have to fill out forms. They spend a lot of time, some estimate about 30 cents of every healthcare dollar is on overhead, on forms that are filled out, on paperwork. Electronic records, transferring your information automatically, so when a doctor gives you a prescription, the Pharmacy knows what it is. You make sure you're getting the right prescription to the right patient. You don't have to fill out the clipboard a gazillion times. Also, on the doctor side, reduces their paperwork overload and lets them be doctors once again. So some of the ways to make sure that there are more providers and more time that providers spend with patients is already underway, and it's part then it's enhanced by health reform, more money to pay off scholarships, more money to encourage kids to go into medicine, and more payment for primary care providers. So we encourage more of the students to go into primary care. We've already started that in Medicare. They will have enhanced payments to actually be primary care docs, to be internists, to provide that basic medical care, and not just uh, for the specialty care. Bottom line is that we're going to encourage through the regular budget uh, the United States Congress passes through this thing called the Recovery Act, which I had the dubious distinction of being asked to run. Remember the President of the State of the Union has said, uh, you know, no one messes with Joe, Sheriff Joe Biden. Uh, God, I, uh, with friends like the President, what do I need, right? I mean, putting me in charge of that. But the point is, remember all the talk? I'm, I'm going to make a comparison. Remember all the talk about how the Recovery Act was a waste and a failure? Look at every headline in the paper today after we've been out there eight months. It's, in fact, responsible for 2.2% of the GDP in the second quarter, 3.3% the third quarter. It has every independent validator on Wall Street has pointed out we have saved or created over a million jobs. We are in bad shape. would have been a million worse. So everybody's now saying, yeah, it's working. It took time to get it up and get it moving and let people see what was really happening. In that, there are hundreds of millions of dollars to do everything from, for example, give community colleges money to give... You know, look, my wife teaches at community college. The single biggest thing that all the community colleges across the country have is they got more men and women wanting to be nurses than they can accept. You know why they can't accept them? Because they don't have enough nurses who have gone on and got advanced degrees to be able to teach them how to be nurses and because the teachers get paid less than the nurses do. So if you're a nurse of 20 years and you're fully capable of training another nurse to be I reg uh, 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 an RN, then what are you going to do? You're going to take a pay cut to go teach after all the hard work you've been through? So what we do is we provide incentives for people to go into teaching so they don't lose that pay. We're providing monies for people who, in fact, will go to medical school and provide and agree to go to served, underserved areas or go into certain specialties that we need so that, in fact, they're able to cover the very folks you're thinking about. So the end result of all this is the combination of the Recovery Act, what we're doing in terms of health care and what the Congress is doing in terms of the regular budget is we are investing more in providing for a net increase 
a net increase in the number of doctors and nurses and getting people back to docs back to seeing it as profitable to be in primary care and preventive medicine. Because the end of that, the re reason why we should take the time and effort to do that is because it will save the system hundreds of billions of dollars over time. So that's a big part of it. Look, I'm going to, uh, um, I, they told me I'm supposed, you, they told me I'm, well, let me put it the other way. <laughs> I, I learned a long time ago, never stand between a man or a woman and their lunch. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm standing between you and lunch. It's a little, it's two minutes after 12. So I'll take one more question, and I don't think I took one from that quadrant over there, or not that quarter. The lovely lady all the way in the back, who's been patient, like you all have. I have not heard too much about the drug prescription cost. You haven't heard too much about the drug prescription cost. A couple things I'll say, and then I'll yield to my colleagues, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll close up here. One of the things about the cost of prescription drugs that has been a big battle that, uh, that um, uh, the congressman and my two Senate colleagues and I serving in the Congress have been fighting for a long time is that uh, it's been a matter of law under the last administration that we could not uh, have uh, um, co competition uh, uh, with drug companies. Uh, we could not say and bargain for Medicare with drug companies. We say we're spending all this money on Medicare, so if you want to provide drugs for folks on Medicare, then we're, we're going to bargain for how much we're willing to pay you. Uh, uh, we cannot do that. You can do it for the VA. You can't do it for any, a, any other government program. There's still a debate about that. That would drive down uh, cost. Uh, with regard to the cost to you individually, not just what the drug itself costs, but what you have to pay to get access to the drug, particularly those of you on Medicare, is we talk about this donut hole. What we think has to happen in order to secure your health as well as your financial well-being is we, in the first 10 years, we cut in this process, we cut in half the amount of money when you fall into that hole, God forbid, and you have to be, you have to, and by the way, it doesn't take a lot to get there. I can tell you, I know, I do what you do. I, I do what you do. L literally every weekend I go home, I take out that, 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 that uh, um, uh, weekly uh, um, little piece of pla those plastic uh, things, and I fill in my mother's prescriptions. I literally, because I got it on the refrigerator door, but you don't want to get it wrong, my mother, like a lot of you, uh, a lot of uh, my mother takes seven different prescriptions, and you got to get it right morning and evening. And so, you know, so it doesn't take an awful lot uh, to get into that donut hole. You can get yourself there pretty quickly. And so, I mean, you spend over 2,300 bucks, 2,700 bucks a year. And if it's over 2,700, you're on your own. Uh, well, what we're going to say is for every dollar you have to spend beyond that $2,700 till you get to the 63, I think it's 63, right, uh, is that we're going to pay half of that dollar for you. So if you're going to had to, if you had $2,700 and $2,710, it'd be $2,705. We'd pay, we'd, we'd pay five of that $10 you're going to have to have. So we fill half the donut hole. And we do that now. And then over the period of this process, we fill that donut hole in. But um, you want to add anything about prescription drugs, guys? No, you covered it. It's that we, know, we know seniors need help, and, and we're committed to getting the donut hole filled. And, uh, but anyway, so look, you, you've all been great. I know we haven't gotten on a, a lot of your questions. Uh, but if you invite me for lunch at one of your homes, I can work <laughs> something out. Uh, you know, you know. Okay. My oldest daughter lives in British Columbia. This stuff about what happens in Canada is a complete falsehood. She had a friend who had a prostate cancer. He was taken care of right away. There is no limitation on the budgets. If they run out of money, they get it later. But nobody gets turned away. All this stuff you hear about Canada is a complete falsehood. And if I may make one suggestion, and that is, Words have power. So when you say public option, you invite socialism. Call it Medicare Part D. Anything other than 
public option. That's a that's a great suggestion, Mr. Great Vice. Great suggestion. You made someone mad as hell. I don't know what what was what, what was that all about. Mr. Vice President, I just want to point out because I know this is a uh, engaged audience. We are jointly, the Vice President and um, the Department of Health and Human Services are putting out a new report today. It's going to be on the website, and the website is actually very good. It's healthreform.gov. Healthreform.gov is the website. The new report is called Health Insurance Reform and Medicare and goes into great detail item by item on some of the things that we've talked about today, where the cost savings are, what the benefits are going to be to Medicare beneficiaries. So I would just health reform print it out. You can share it with your friends. You can read it. Um, and I just think a lot of the details of what the Vice President has covered today are on the report that's going to be filed on the website. Well, folks, you've, you've been a wonderful, you've been a wonderful audience. You all know what you're talking about. So would some of you come with me to my next meeting to help fix Afghanistan? I, uh, uh, I, I could use some input on there. All kidding aside, thank you so much. I, uh, I, uh, I appreciate it very much. Thanks.